Hi everyone, Assalamu alaikum. Welcome back to uh, Introduction to English Literature. Uh, okay, so last time we started a little bit with the Romantics, but today we will dive more uh, deeper into the Romantic literature, uh, the, romant the, the Romantic poetry. Um, today we'll start with William Blake, um, who is actually a pre-Romantic poet and then uh, to the co-founder of the Romantic school, uh, Wordsworth. Uh, as you might know, in your third year, especially those who are doing uh, English literature, uh, not uh, the education guys, not sure about the translation though, uh, you will be taking uh, a separate course just for the Romantic poetry. Uh, okay, or romantic literature, because you'll be taking Frankenstein as well. Um, I guess it depends. Yeah. Okay, so we will just in in the in the next. I guess today, tomorrow, the day. Okay, in the next three lectures we will be doing romantic literature. Just you know some glimpses here and there, in order to let you um, just have an idea about the romantic literature, uh, because you will come back to it in details in the romantic poetry and romantic literature course, but also in the poetry course and also in the uh, literary criticism courses. And so many times you will always come back to romanticism because romanticism is, uh, and the romantic literature is a key to understand uh, English literature and to, to, to feel the English literature because it's it's all about you know remember last time it's all about feelings uh, and uh, and tasting uh, the arts okay so um, before we start I want you to remember to to think about the word romantic what does the word romantic indicate what does it mean when you say romantic because so many people when you say romantic they connect it to you know to love to um, uh you know when you say this is a romantic movie uh you mean a movie about two lovers you know uh, meeting uh, somewhere in, in a restaurant or something and then falling in love and okay but this is not act and this is why so many people when when they know that they're having a romantic uh literature course or when when I tell when I told my friends that I'm taking a romantic literature course, those who are not doing English literature, they would be like laughing. You're taking romantic literature, you know. They would thought that this is uh, a course of of texts about love or lovers or whatever. But no, romanticism is is something bigger than this. Um, and the word romantic has so many meanings depending on the context. But always remember here when we talk about the romantics here. It is in a way connected to to the medieval ages, the the, the age of the Romans, you know, the romantic uh, the romantic ages. Uh, but here, it's always connected to feelings, and because remember, uh, overflow feelings, emotions, but also to nature. Okay, uh, but also romantic could be you know dreamy. So think about this. What what does it mean? Uh, what what does it indicate? What other uh, meanings uh, could the word romantic or the term romantic give in, in, in particular contexts here or there. Okay, so today we will remember quickly what we talked about, what we discussed last time, and then we will move to William Blake, the amazing William Blake, uh, who is a pre-romantic poet. Um, I love all the romantic poets. I love the romantic poetry. So every time when we discuss a new poet, I'll always say that this is an amazing poet. I love him. Okay, I love them. Basically, I love Percy Shelley more, maybe, uh, and the Blake, of course, but I'll always uh, tell you that I love this poet, because I love the romantic poets, okay? And then we'll move to William Wordsworth, who is actually, uh, with Coleridge, uh, the, the founders of uh, Romanticism, or the, the English Romantic School. Okay, uh, Jen, quickly, Jen, let's, let's revise that it lasted only for 40 years. It's two generations. We talk about the, the two generations. Um, and it was affected, influenced by the French Revolution and the American Revolution, you know, the age of revolutions, uh, revolutionary ideas. And this is why they are modernist in a way. 
uh, both uh, Wordsworth and Coleridge published the lyrical ballads, and then uh, they uh, republished it with a preface, um, explaining their ideas, what they mean, how poetry should be according to them. And then um, we, we discussed how they contrasted the Augustan, the Augustan age and the classical age. And I'll keep referring to this, especially next time when we discuss Coleridge. They usually, uh, when they bring something to their poetry from the past, they don't go back to the Augustan age because they, they, they are against, they are contrasted with the Augustan age. Nor do they go back to usually the Renaissance uh, era, sometimes, not even the Renaissance era. They go back even further uh, to the medieval ages uh, because they think that people back back then were more interested you know in in the nature in the in the, in the innocence of of nature unlike the you know the, the the augustan age where they were more interested in didactic literature in a way you know teaching and pleasing okay so they were contrasted with those people and poetry for them is the spontaneous overflow of powerful emotions or feeling this is part of the definition not the whole definition today we will um, probably continue the rest of it uh, the spontaneous overflow of powerful emotions or feelings recollected in tranquility this is the, the, the second part we'll talk about this uh, today okay uh, we said that their language was simple more simple their subject matters we no longer have, you know, queens and kings and, and, and wars and gods and Adam and Eve. No, we just have, you know, Lucy Gray. We have a rose. We have a tiger. We have um, a, 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 a flower, a bird, uh, a rainbow, you know, simple things, especially things from the nature. Uh, and then we have, and this is very important, the, the new poetic forms, okay? Again, they broke with the uh, strict rigid forms of the medieval, uh, of the medieval, uh, or, sorry, of the neoclassical era uh, that was before them. Remember uh, Alexander Pope? Almost every single line has 10 syllables, five feet, um, the same rhyme scheme, heroic couplets, always heroic couplets everywhere. Very strict, very rigid, and he, satirized strongly everyone who didn't do the same uh, as he did. He hated everyone, as we all know. Okay? And again, the feelings and the heart are controlling in, uh, in, the, romantic, uh, in the romantic literature. The sense of individuality is also significant. Uh, no more collectiveness. Mostly individual, how, how they, we will see this now with, uh, with, with Wordsworth and nature. And we, we, we talked about the escapism, how they were escapists in a way. They escaped the corrupted city instead of trying to, to fight back and instead of trying to, to fix the problems, they escaped to the nature, to, to the country, to the countryside, uh, where there's no, there's no um, corruption and uh, you know, no industrial revolution uh, effects uh, out there. And we also said, and, and we will see this so many times, how childhood was a source of inspiration for them as, as a symbol of, of innocence. Um, okay, so uh, okay, so with William Blake, uh, again, he he's not a completely romantic poet. He was before Wordsworth and Coleridge. Uh, he was a pre-romantic poet. He had some similar uh, features, and we will see this now in a bit, uh, but he did not talk about his, his poetry, his literature, unlike Coleridge and Wordsworth. They were poets and the critics, but he was only a poet. He wrote poetry that was new, revolutionary, but in a way without, um, without theoretical... Uh, fuss here and there about, about his, his poetry. Um, mostly, most importantly, he was a very individual poet. Uh, he had an individual view uh, of the world. He saw the world from, his, uh, from, from this 
a single or individual uh, perspective. Uh, and his poetic style, his uh, symbols, his ideas, all, all, all things that he brought to literature, to the English literature was in a complete contrast, the extreme opposite of what the Augustans uh, preached about the whole time. And we'll see this in a bit. Uh, always when you hear of Blake, okay, William Blake, always every time you, you hear his name, you should remember two things. One, songs of innocence, two, songs of experience. Um, now, Blake is, for me, the master of symbolism. His literature, like we will see the, now the sick rose, uh, some people say that it's a symbol of symbolism in a way. Crazy, yes, but uh, this is how much he was into, you know, symbols and symbolizing uh, stuff. Now, every time he had a symbol for innocence, he had another poem for a symbol of experience that contrasts it. For example, we have the lamb. The lamb is a symbol of innocence from his collective, from his volume, from uh, songs of innocence. Now, you know, the lamb is even from Christianity, it's a symbol of innocence, a symbol of, um, of Jesus Christ, in a way, uh, the lamb. Uh, you know, the lamb, the sheep, the lamb. Okay, so now he's talking about the lamb or to the lamb. Little lamb, who made thee? Dost thou know who made thee? He's talking to the lamb and see even the language and uh, the way he, uh, he talks uh, in, in, this, in this poem. But then we have the tiger as a symbol of experience. And see, notice how the way that the word tiger is written. Tiger, tiger, burning bright in the forest of the night. What immortal hand or eye could frame thy fearful, thy fearful symmetry? So again, the language is very simple. No tiger, tiger burning bright in the forest of the night. What immortal hand or eye could frame thy fearful symmetry? Very simple language uh, and very, uh, you know, in a way, some people find it childish, annoying, ch children literature. But can you, first before, can you see the rhyme scheme here? We have bright night, eye symmetry. So bright and night have the same rhyme scheme, they rhyme perfectly, AA. And then we have eye and symmetry. We have some kind of BB, but a small B, something imperfect rhyme scheme, because we have eye and symmetry, not symmetry. Again. We always said that when we have this conflict, it's for one of two reasons. Now, for poems, especially the, you know, poems from very old ages, it could be that people used to pronounce this word differently. And now they, the way they pronounce it changed. This is why you have an imperfect rhyme scheme. But I don't like this because, you know, this is a lazy interpretation. You don't want to think about this. And you would be like, okay, it has changed the way they, but still it's possible, but you know, it's lazy. But the beauty of literature is to go to dive deeper. Is that because maybe this imperfect rhyme uh, is, is a signal. It's, it's, it's the poet sending us a message here. You know, there's something here. Now we have this famous question of people always asking, um, but did the poet actually meant this? Uh, actually mean this? Did he intend it? It does not matter. Remember the very first cl uh, class we talked in, in this course? It doesn't matter. But still, usually, 90% of the time, yes, the poet means it, intends it. And when you start writing poetry, you understand uh, what I mean by this. Because in poetry always, when something is there, it's always there for a reason. If it's not there, it's not there for a reason. Uh, because, you know, poetry is small text usually, so everything there is, is, is planned, in a way. So why we have symmetry, not symmetry, not, not a word that rhymes with I. And he could have easily found a word that rhymes with I, right? But why? When the romantics, this is a new 
uh, form of, of poetry. And which, which reminds us of, uh, of our guy, uh, what's his name, uh, John Donne, right? Breaking the, the rules, the form. But it's not only this, it's not only this. Let's read, tiger, tiger, but he's talking about the tiger, burning bright, you know the tiger? The tiger, you know the tiger, the animal, the tiger, you know, uh, the, the, this animal is very, you know, amazing when you look at the tiger or the details, how frightening uh, the, the tiger looks, right? So in the forest of the night, he's talking to the tiger and then he's asking, what immortal hand or eye? Can you, can you compare this to the previous one with the lamb? Uh, little lamb who made thee, but now what immortal hand or or I could frame thy fearful symmetry. Who is he talking to? Is he talking to the tiger? Is he, is he talking simply to, uh, to an animal? Or is he talking to someone else or to something else, but uh, this, this tiger symbolizes uh, this another thing? So usually yes, because what immortal hand or eye could frame thy fear for symmetry and when we complete reading uh the poem it's a it's a very short poem by the way you can search it in the youtube less than a minute you can read it uh, on the internet uh, when you complete reading uh the poem you find that he's clearly not talking to to a tiger there's something here something else uh maybe it's um and can you uh can you count the syllables here Tai ga Taiga burning bright in the full rest of the night. See, still seven. What? E, mo, tell, hand, or I. Seven. But now count this. Could frame thy fee full symmetry. Now we have eight. So in this line, could frame thy fee full symmetry, we have uh, imperfect rhyme scheme and we have an extra seven. So clearly, Blake is giving a message here, a sign for something. There's something here in this line. You know, it's odd. Uh, the rhyme scheme has a problem here, the, the, the number of the syllables. So what's he trying to communicate to, to us? And this is called, well, I'm sorry, this is called the tension. You know, this tension here. The poet is trying again to give us a signal, a message to something. And this goes to how we understand uh, the poem. Again, this is a very individual poem, so everyone reads it in, in a different way. Some people love to read the tiger as the industrial revolution. So it's talking to the industrial revolution. And you know the word symmetry? The word symmetry means harmony, you know? Symmetry, harmony, uh, perfection in a way. So funny or ironically enough, the word symmetry is the word that breaks the symmetry of the poem. You know, in, the, in, the, in this word, fearful symmetry, the symmetry of the poem is, is broken. Uh, it's breached in a way. Why is he trying to communicate that this industry, because you know, when, when, when man created the, the industries and the, the, uh, the, the industry, when started the industrial revolution uh, with all the factories here and there, why? Why did we start this? Because we wanted to make life easier. We wanted to make life better, you know, to save time and effort. But what we actually did is that we, we destroyed the cities, we destroyed um, uh, the nature, and we uh, even we destroyed the man, the humans, because um, usually uh, the capitalists won't pay uh, their workers enough money. And people, all the people, went from the countryside to to the cities to work in the factories and then the revolution uh, back then because they wanted to become rich and something, you know, to work just for eight hours something and to become rich. But they actually did not become rich because they would just uh, give them a very little amounts uh, of, of money to keep them just, you know, surviving, but they never became actually uh, rich. So maybe this is his message. This tiger, this great thing that we created, that we intended to save life with, to save time, to save effort, to make everything better, actually destroyed life, destroyed nature. Okay? So this is, this might be his, uh, his message here. Uh, what else could the tiger um, be? Could, be? could it be the government? 
Could it be the occupation, the Israeli, the Israeli occupation? What could it be, the tiger here? That is, you know, uh, intended to be good, but then it actually turned out to be, to be really bad. So this is again William, Blake, especially William Blake. It's always symbols. Uh, every time, every uh, almost uh, in most of his uh, his poetry, he always have uh, symbolism, and everything is a symbol of, of something else. Let's see uh, this very important uh, poem, the Sikros. Now the tiger, you will also um, uh, read it and and study it again in the romantic course and in the poetry course maybe. Also the Sikros. They are the, the most uh, famous um, poems by, by William Blake. And then we will quickly have London uh, in a bit. Now, the sick rose, O rose, is, is a poem about a rose, a sick rose. Not a queen, not a king, not, um, not you know, uh, Adam, not Eve, remember? Not, not even a lover, a courtier. Uh, uh, a lover from the court, nothing great, nothing significant. It's a rose. And the previous one, it's a tiger. He's talking to, you know, trivial things, little things here and there. And this is romanticism, you know, focusing on the, on the details, on the, on the little things here and there, instead of the greater things, the collective things. So he's talking to a rose, to a sick rose. Oh, rose, thou art sick. Thou art means you are. Now we are familiar with, with the language, the poetic language. By the way, people to this very day, when they write poetry, sometimes they use uh, thou and thee and art. And, you know, it usually has something to do with, um, with the meanings. You know, when you bring something into textuality, when you bring something from somewhere, some, from somewhere else. Oh, Rose, thou art sick, the invisible worm. You know the worm, it do that, the invisible worm, this, in, this very small creature. Oros, thou art sick, the invisible worm that flies in the night, in the, in the howling storm, has found out thy bit of crimson joy, and his dark secret love does thy life destroy. Can you count, can you see a rhyme scheme? Uh, sick, worm, night, storm. So we have A, B, C, B. And then we have bid, joy, love, destroy, right? So we have an A, B, A, B. So again, the form is, uh, is a new form. You know, there's no rule because see the first uh, stanza. And if you also count the, count the syllable, uh, you will have the same, um, uh, the, the same point again. So uh, what is this poem about? A rose that is uh, sick. Why is the... You know, the rose is ill, sick. Why? Because the worm, uh, the very, the invisible, you know, the invisible worm, and this word invisible, you know, it gives it some kind of, I don't know, um, uh, this darkness, uh, evil uh, atmosphere around, because it's invisible, you know, usually the dark is invisible. The invisible worm that flies in the night, even again the night, you know, the night, always bad things happen in the night. Did, Mosby, did Mosby's mother told him that nothing good happens after 2 a.m.? So, you know, um, the invisible worm that flies in the night has found thy bed, found out thy bed, you know, the, 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 the rose the, of crimson joy, and his dark, his, oh, not it, it's his. So, now we have the rose is maybe a girl and the, the, the worm is, is a boy. His dark secret love this does thy life destroy, destroy your life. So clearly, is he talking about a, a, a rose and, and a worm? Maybe, maybe. But maybe not, probably not. He's talking about something else. Maybe about a, a, a woman and a man. So, you know, a rose is a, is a little girl and there's this man who, you know, this happens nowadays a lot. Please don't do this. Uh, you know, people, guys would go to the girls and talk to, talk to them about love, about, you know, good things. You will do this and that. And then they, they don't do nothing. They just uh, deceive them and destroy their lives, destroy, break their hearts. So maybe this is about it. You know, the rose is the girl and this worm 
uh, the very dark, you know, dark secret love, you know, not love, not secret love, dark secret love. Nothing good happens in the secret, right? And it's dark, it's evil. Uh, could this poem be about the industrial, industrial revolution? Could this one be the industrial revolution? And the rose is the nature, where the industrial revolution uh, destroyed the nature. Could the worm be the Israeli occupation and the rose is Hayy Sheikh Jarrah? Could, could it be this way? So it's always, uh, and this is again symbolism and this is again William Blake. It's always how you read the poem. And this is why I love uh, William Blake because I am part of the poem. You are part of the, everyone, every single individual reader is part of, of the text in a way or another. So this is, um, and, and this is uh, William Blake and the sick rose. Okay. Uh, now, this is in your book also, London. Um, he was, again, William Blake, obsessed with the city. And he was a political, um, a political poet. His poetry was, in a way, political, you know, talking to, uh, to the government, to the people about political stuff. And... The romantics, including our friend William Blake, are again obsessed with nature. They love, they love nature, right? But now with the Industrial Revolution and with all the changes uh, that, that happened and affected London, and, and with all the people coming from the countryside to London, and with all the factories uh, in, in London, London became a corrupted city, you know, even Back then, at th that time, the, the 18th century, uh, the, uh, the, the environment was really, uh, now it's, it's even worse in the whole world, but London, especially London back then, uh, had a really bad time uh, with the environment, um, uh, with all the factories and all the toxic um, garbage and, and everything. And then, he uh, he was wandering. We will see we will see the wandering a lot with the romantics. We will see it again uh, now with William Wordsworth. He was wandering, you know, wandering, walking, walking around, wandering. Uh, I wandered through each chartered street. So chartered mean it's it's giving it's property in a way, you know. So so this street belongs to someone now. It's no longer you know like in nature nothing belongs to someone or to, you know. It's, it's for everyone. But now, no, I wander through each chartered street near where the chartered, even the Thames, remember the Thames, the very, it's, it's a symbol of London, of England. Even the Thames, the river, is chartered. It's no longer for the nature, part of the, no, it's, it, it belongs to someone, or to, to someone or to somebody or to something. Near where the chartered Thames does flow, and mark in every face, in, in every face I meet, marks of weakness, marks of woe. Woe he, here means sadness. So see how the industrial revolution it changed um, uh, people. In every face I meet, marks of weakness, marks of woe. And see that I'm skiing A B A B. Okay. Then in every cry of every man. In every infant's cry of fear, in every voice, in every ban, the mind forged manacles I hear. You know, manacles are kalapshat, but they are not in the hands, they are in the mind, they are forged in the mind. So they are restricting and limiting uh, the mind. Mind forged manacles I hear. So now, he's, see, he's talking about London after the Industrial Revolution and how. Um, it destroyed the nature, it destroyed the man, um, even the kids, the infants, uh, the sorts of innocence are afraid. So they are, um, they are afraid, they are uh, destroyed by the industrial revolution. Nature is destroyed. Okay, so this was our guy. Um, This is our guy, William Blake. Uh, and again, he was a pre-romantic poet. Now let's move to the co-founder of romanticism, William Wordsworth. The first one to 
write romantic poetry and to talk about it. So Blake only wrote poetry, but Wordsworth um, preached, did the theoretical work as well. Um, now this is the complete uh, definition. Poetry is the spontaneous. Now there is more more to this. There's an ellipsis as you can see, but this is the most important uh, part of like this. This covers the whole definition. Poetry is the spontaneous. You know, spontaneous. Spont it's not a planned. It's not a pre. It's spontaneous. Afawi. Okay, afi afwi. Spontaneous. The spontaneous overflow. So poetry is about feelings, but not any feelings, the flow of feelings. And not the flow of any feelings, the flow of powerful feelings. And not just flow, overflow, you know flow? Overflow. So it's everywhere, overflow of powerful feelings. And not only this, but this overflow is spontaneous. So this is poetry, just feelings. You know, you just talk about, you don't plan, you don't, spend years writing one poem you know milton spent so many years writing his, his so many poets like um there is this poem uh by abu tamam i guess or mutanabi I, I don't really remember where he spends 40 years writing one poem okay and another one who spends in every poem he spends 10 years because you know he wants a poem to be perfect nothing here or there is um, has a problem. Everything is perfect. Uh, so, for the for the romantics, no, they don't do this. Like not like Dryden and like um, all the the Augustan guys. Uh, remember Alexander Pop? Their poetry was perfect, and in order to produce this perfect uh, this perfection, you would spend times, you know, with every word and to put this or that and to go back to the dictionary and then you know to find the perfect word with the perfect meter and the perfect rhyme and everything and the music but with uh with romantics no it's, it's just spontaneous and the language is just for wordsworth he's, he he says that we should discuss the topics of every day you know the common topics the topics that people really care about in the language that people usually use so the real language of men the everyday man language and man here means a human again not just you know not males you know humans in general um maybe because english is sexist the language maybe all languages are sexist and maybe because the word men means men and women okay but again the the diction the language diction means the word choice the language the language should be based on the real language of men how people actually talk not using the difficult the highly sophisticated intellectual words to show off like uh, the previous poets used to do no just using the real language of people to talk about their common life their actual concerns so the themes and the language are, the, are, are different okay uh and see this is the daffodils it starts with i usually in wordsworth his uh he is the main character in his poetry he he himself he's talking about his own experiences he is the main character so he's the poet and the speaker unlike in so many usually in poetry the author is not the speaker so, you know, you can talk about your, your mistress, your lover, but you don't actually talking to your own wife or your own girlfriend. You just, you know, uh, as if there's a character, you know, the speaker uh, in, 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 the, in the poem. But no, with, with Wordsworth, no, he's the, the speaker. Now, this is the daffodils, uh, maybe his most famous, most important text, uh, the daffodils. Now, the story... He was with his sister, Judith. Okay, they were walking and then they saw um, daffodils. You know the daffodil? It's um, uh, a flower, kind of uh, um, a yellow, golden flower. Now you will see the picture. Uh, so he's, he was with his, um, with his sister and then they saw the daffodils and then he wrote this uh, poem later. Uh, let me just 
share with you this very share sound share okay I want to share with you this uh, beautiful recitation of, of the poem I wandered lonely as a cloud by William Wordsworth I hope it's working I wandered lonely as a cloud that floats on high o'er vales and hills when all at once i saw a crowd a host of golden daffodils beside the lake beneath the trees fluttering and dancing in the breeze continuous as the stars that shine and twinkle on the milky way they stretched in never-ending line along the margin of a bay ten thousand saw i at a glance tossing their heads in sprightly dance. The waves beside them danced, but they outdid the sparkling waves in glee. A poet could not but be gay in such a jocund company. I gazed and gazed, but little thought what wealth the show to me had brought. For oft when on my couch I lie in vacant or in pensive mood, they flash upon that inward eye which is the bliss of solitude. And then my heart with pleasure fills and dances with the daffodils. So here are the daffodils. Here are the daffodils. You know this, uh, these beautiful golden yellow flowers? These are the daffodils. So again, what's this poem about? I wandered lonely as a cloud that floats on high o'er hills, o'er vales and hills, when all at once I saw a crowd. So who is he? Again, he is Wordsworth. The, the poet is the speaker. He wandered lonely. So we have I and we have lonely. So see here, not we. So it's I, only I. He's the character, he's the speaker. And we have lonely. So we have this uh, theme distance of solitude, individualism, loneliness. I wandered lonely. Now, when you wander, you could wander like, uh, like a boy, like a horse. And if you want to, to wander, to walk around, like from the sky, you could be a bird. But no, he wandered lonely as a cloud, not a boy, not a horse, not a rabbit. Not even a bird, but as a cloud. Why a cloud? Why not a cow? Why not um, a beautiful bird here or there? Why a cloud? You know the cloud? Because in a way he's a romantic poet. He wants to be free. Like the cloud. There's no... The cloud is not going anywhere. There is no plan. There is no... There's nothing to do. Just, you know... Wandering freely, with nowhere to go um, or to come from, you know, just being there in the sky. So he wandered lonely as a cloud. And again, this is a simile. Now we are familiar with the similes, the simile, because he uses as and like. Now here he uses as. I wandered lonely as a cloud. Okay, not a metaphor, because in a metaphor, it's hidden. We don't have as and like. But here it's clearly saying, I wandered as a cloud. So here's a simile. I wandered lonely as a cloud. And he's giving himself, he's, he's the person, I don't know, dehumanizing himself, uh, depersonalizing himself, because he's not a human, no longer a human. In a way, he's like a cloud that's, that floats on high over veils and hills, up and down, everywhere. When all at once I, I saw, again, the, 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 the pronoun I saw, and notice here, saw, in the past, I saw a crowd. So notice the tense, the past, the past simple. I saw a, cloud, a crowd. What's a crowd? A crowd, you know, a big crowd. Of what? A host? You know, a host, the host is, is the one that welcomes the guests. So it's welcoming, a welcoming crowd, a host of golden daffodils. 
So a crowd of daffodils. So daffodils are like a crowd, you know, the crowd, the crowd. Hashd, hashdun min al ايش ايش ال daffodils in Arabic? I don't know what they are translated into. Okay, but they are also golden. He's stressing the beauty of their color. A host of golden daffodils. Where are they? Beside the lake, beneath the trees. Now he's in the cloud up there, but he can see that the daffodils are beside the lake and beneath the trees. From up there, he can see, maybe, because again, this is Puti. This is how Puti works, the suspension of disbelief. We'll talk about this next time. So he, he saw the daffodils beside the lake, beneath the trees, fluttering and dancing in the breeze. What are the daffodils doing? They're fluttering and dancing. They're fluttering and dancing. The daffodils, the flowers are dancing in the breeze. See the nature, how beautiful nature is? And can you see how he dehumanized himself? He's a cloud, but the nature is personified, is humanized. Now, the nature is dancing and fluttering. The opposite. Now, he's no longer a human, but the nature is, in a way, personified, more humanized. Can you, can you count the syllables? Can you see the rhyme scheme? Cloud, hills, crowd, daffodils. So you have A, B, A, B, trees, breeze, C, C, right? Cloud, crowd, hills, daffodils, and then we have trees and breeze. Continuous as the stars that shine. Again, we have a simile here. Continuous as the stars, like the stars. So we have a simile because we have the word as. Continuous as the stars that shine and twinkle on the Milky Way. So they are like the stars that shine and twinkle. See how beautiful it's looking over the dark? Like how many times do you see... Um, yeah, flowers and daffodils and birds every day. They are everywhere, right? But do we see in this? Do do we see these flowers this way? Like, can you see how the romantics see nature and twinkle on the Milky Way? They stretched. Not again the uh, the verb, the past uh, tense. They stretched in never-ending line. Crowd a lot of. Um, daffodils. They stretched in a never-ending line along the margin of a bay 10,000 soi at a glance. A glance, you know, when lamha, okay, a glance. 10,000. Did he count them? No, but you know, he's saying a lot. 10,000 soi. So I hear it's, it's, it's I saw at a glance, but you know, fronting and delaying. 10,000, so I. So it's originally I saw 10,000 daffodils at a glance. 10,000, so I at a glance. Tossing their heads. They even have heads. They are very person, uh, personified, right? They are very humanized. Tossing their heads in sprightly dance. They are dancing and tossing their heads and they are very happy. The waves beside them dance. Even the waves are dancing. But they outdid the sparkling waves in glee. So they, they are even better. A poet could not but be gay in such a jacant company. A poet could not but be gay. Now, the word gay back then did not mean homosexual. It meant happy. So a poet could not but be gay. Like we even do this in Arabic. It means that a poet was gay, was happy. OK? A poet could be happy, only be happy. A it means a poet could only be happy, could only be gay in such a jacant company. With this, when he's accompanying the nature, when he's with nature. Then I gazed and gazed, but little thought. So, you know, I gazed, I looked, I gazed and gazed, but little thought. So... More gazing, more looking, but less thinking. This is romanticism, you know. Not like the, you know, the age of, of the age of logic, the age of reason, the, the Augustan age, because they thought a lot about everything. But people were fed of their, you know, just talking and thinking and philosophy. I gazed and gazed, but little thought what wealth the show to me had brought. So I just gazed. I was just enjoying 
and not thinking. Can you see uh, the syllables here? They and gay, a, a, and we have B and company, glee and company, not company. No, we have glee and company. Um, so there's an there's imperfection here. Why? Again, there should be something. Uh, I gazed and gazed, but little thought what wealth brought. So we have here imperfection. Why? What is trying to say? And I want you to notice something else. Now, for the whole poem previously, he uses I, 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 right? I, to me, had brought. So why is he here always using the first person narrate, narrator? But here, in, in, in this, in, the, in these two lines, a poet could not but be gay in such a jacant company. He's using the third person narrator, a poet. Not I could not, but he could have easily said, I could not but be gay in such jacant company. Why did he say a poet could not but be gay in such a jacant company? Why is it I? Why is it not I? Why is it a poet? He or she, a third person, a third person, uh, sorry, a third person um, uh, pronoun. A poet could not but be gay. Okay, maybe he's not talking about himself. Maybe he's talking about other poets, the previous ones. Because what did poets do seeing this very beautiful uh, scene? They would just be happy and that's it. They would feel happy. They would just, you know, enjoy the scene and that's it. This is what poets would do. But for him, no. This is not what he does. He's different. He's criticizing them. He's saying that this is not the way that we should treat nature. Not only just seeing um, while we are in the company of nature, we are happy and then that's it. No. It's different. How is it different? Let's see. For oft, when on my couch I lie. You know the couch? The couch? Can I buy it? Roft when on my couch I lie, in vacant or in pensive mood, they flash upon the inward eye, which is the bliss of solitude, and then my heart with pleasure fills and dances with the daffodils. Now he moved to, to I, my, to the first person pronouns. But can you notice that he's no longer using the past tense? I lie, they flash, fills, dances. So now we have present simple, why? Because he's now talking about a habit, talking about now. Every time when he's in his couch, you know, resting, in, in, in a pensive mood, you know, feeling in peace. These memories of the daffodils of nature flash, come back to him. And he, when he remembers them, he feels happy. So he doesn't only enjoy them and that's it. No, he saves them in his mind in a way. He just recorded, he just records the nature and saves the scene in his, in, in, inside his mind. And then he remembers it and feels happy about it. And then my heart with pleasure fills and dances with the daffodils. And this is why, can, can we come back to, to the definition? Can we come back to the definition of, uh, of, of, uh, of poetry for, for William Wordsworth? The spontaneous overflow of powerful feelings. We said that this is the first part. It's a true, but this is the first part of the poem because it's recollected in tranquility. Recollected means remembered, you know, recollected, re brought in tranquility, you know, tranquility, peace. So here he's in the couch, so he's in peace, right? He's He's feeling peaceful, 
comfortable in the couch. So he recollects, and this is why it's in the in the present because it's now. He he go, he went to the daffodils. He saw the daffodils back somewhere in the in the past, but now he's alone. What does he do when he's alone? He remembers. For oft, oft means often. When on my couch I lie in vacant or in pensive mood, they flash upon that inward eye, inward eye, okay, which is the bliss of solitude, العين الداخلية, you know, in the basir or something, which is the bliss of solitude. You know the difference between solitude and loneliness? They both means being alone, but solitude is something that you you choose to be alone. You choose uh, this loneliness, okay? So it's not in a way sad negative no solitude is something more positive we all need solitude sometimes to be to be alone to think to take time with ourselves and then every time i remember the daffodils my heart with pleasure fills and dances with the daffodils you know people um sometimes they do uh, uh you know some practices it's good to do it sometimes when you feel um anxious or when you have um some sort of difficult times or something and you're breaking down it's always advised to close your eyes take a deep breath and to remember a scene that you love from the nature maybe from your pet your cat your dog your um your friends your family to remember a scene that makes you happy which will actually calm you and and actually uh, make you uh, in a way less um, less sad or less anxious so you know some people they have uh, anxiety attacks they they always devise them so to 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 just to relax to close their eyes to close their eyes to to just to uh, to take deep breaths and to to remember something so for Wordsworth this something is the, the daffodils and in other poems, we have the rainbow, a very beautiful uh, poem, My Heart Leaves. Um, so this is the daffodils. This is William Wordsworth. And this is um, uh, romanticism, focusing on the individuality. I, my, it's just one. Remember, he was with his sister. Now, his sister, Judith uh, Wordsworth, she talks in her diaries about this. She, she says that she was with her brother, and then they saw the daffodils. But he, for him, because he's a romantic poet, he doesn't mention her because she's not important. Is he uh, kicking her out because he's anti-feminist? Maybe, maybe. But also because he's a he's a romantic poet. He's, um, you know, enjoying the nature alone. It should be always, you know, in solitude. Uh, she, she's not in the scene. He's alone, like a cloud wandering. From, from above, alone. Nobody with him, using I, I. It's all the nature. And see how he uh, gives the nature some human features. The nature is personified. While uh, he's de-personalized uh, in a way. He's like a cloud or something. Uh, the language, can you see the language is very simple. We, we, we almost don't use, don't go back to, to the dictionary. Right, it's it's a very simple language. Uh, we have similes and we have metaphors, but we saw how we have two, maybe or three similes in in Wordsworth's uh, the daffodils. We talked uh, in the, about it always when you read poetry, you should focus on the tense, you should focus on the rhyme scheme, where there is something. It's it's the tension. What does what does it indicate? What does what does it tell us? Okay, so where is the tension here? It's with uh, gay and company. Right, um, and we have. I talked probably about this before. Uh, we don't have time to see Lucy Gray because it's almost an hour now, um, so we, we won't do Lucy Gray. But um, generally, even in the daffodils, we have something for the romantics called the childlike experience. Not only for the romantics; it's something general. Uh, I wrote a text, I, I mentioned it before, it's, it's some kind of childlike experience, how children see the world. Because for, for, for words where adults, the, the state of being an adult, 
create some veil of familiarity. You know, veil, you know, the veil, the hijab, hajiz, a veil of familiarity. Because when you see this, the first time a kid sees the light, it's like, you know, I remember uh, in, in, in one of the words, one of my cousins, so al kashaf for the first time, the flashlight, and he was like amazed by it. Uh, when they, they first see the, the candles, when they, when they see the dog for the first time, or the bird, or the cat, Kids are always amazed by these things. And every time a cat would see the donkey or, or a cat or, 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 uh, or the light, or the, every time uh, they would be surprised again as if it's the first time, right? Because they're always amazed. They're always shocked by the nature, by everything here and there. It's always new, even if they saw it a thousand times. But then when you grow up more and more, when you become more of an adult, there's this veil of family. Everything becomes familiar. Like this scene of the flowers, this scene of, of birds, it's always amazing. But when you get used to it, uh, you forget how amazing it is. But for the romantics, they always go back to childhood. And this is why the, chi the child is the father of the man. Because we, when we see children and how they, they do stuff and how they react to, to the things, we, we learn from them how we should uh, learn and how we should react uh, to everything uh, instead of treating everything as if it is familiar and normal when it is actually not familiar, not normal. So this is uh, World Worth. See Lucy Gray, it's a very, uh, do you know Fairuz's Ana Shadi? A very uh, famous song by Fairuz, Ana Shadi, uh, something like this. It's very fa similar to this, um, to this poem, uh, please read it, uh, or you can listen to it on YouTube or something. Very interesting one, but we don't have act time, uh, unfortunately, to see Lucy Gray. Um, so this is uh, romanticism, guys. We will talk more about this, but again, we can't talk about everything because we just take background, just uh, general ideas. Uh, but it's it's really interesting. I love the romantic literature. I love the romantics. Uh, the, their, their poetry is very original and very uh, beautiful. Now, some people, because with all the things that we saw and we will see with the romantics, breaking the rules sometimes, uh, they see similarities between the romantics and the, meta the metaphysicals. And later on, we saw this with uh, Blake and we will see it again with the, with the new generation of romantic. Uh, of romantic poets, they, in a way, um, they co all of them contrasted the previous um, teachings, uh, but some of them even uh, were uh, rebels, were revolutionists. We will see this. So some people think that the, the romantics and the metaphysicals are similar, but other people would say no. The metaphysicals, their their themes are very uh, complicated. They they use logic, a lot of logic. Remember John Donne, a lot of logic here and there. So they're not very similar. But the romantics are very simple, you know, their language is very simple, not like uh, the metaphysicals. They use tough words, sometimes strong words. So some people find similarities, others find dif differences. What do you think? Do you think they're similar, different? In what, in, in which way uh, do you think they are similar or different? Uh, tell, me, uh, tell me in the Facebook group. And that's it for today. See you, inshallah, next time with Coleridge, with Keats, and with maybe Lord Byron. I'm not sure if we'll have time for all of them. But we will see inshallah next time. Thank you very much, uh, everyone, and see you.